Hello and welcome. You are listening to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Salted Caramel Gerasimovich. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> and I'm Cameron Lalana, who apparently looked good enough today that the cashier at Safeway thought I could afford hundred dollar tequila. I, I think you could. I think you I, that could. I mean, for what it's worth. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, I, like, I can't afford tequila of that price. I would just be shaving a lot of money off my rent for this month. Yeah, well, it's one or the other. It's either rent yeah. or tequila. Yeah, it's a hard choice every single... <laughs> when, I get, when I get to the first week of every month, it's a pretty difficult choice. I also question who buys really expensive liquor at the grocery store. I don't know how your grocery stores are, but wouldn't you go to like an actual liquor store? He wasn't even recommending that store he was like oh go to the market down the road they have this really uh-huh. good like hundred dollar tequila there and i was staring at him nodding and just being polite i was like yeah that sounds really good internally thinking i, I can't spend a hundred dollars on tequila why would you think i would spend that i mean i just came i just came home from work so maybe it was the tie but <laughs> <laughs> i like even if i could i wouldn't i yeah. just think i don't know yeah well, i've never spent nearly that much money on a single bottle uh, on anything yeah, well, okay. <laughs> on anything. On any one single item, probably. Well, <laughs> like binge purchases, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this week, we are continuing on with Sankhya. I'm going to adapt Matt's description of Part 2 of Sankhya. We're reading Sankhya Part 2, subheadle Re. Before we get into the actual content, Matt, what are you drinking? I am drinking the only thing that has sustained me through quarantine through this long series of events that we call life i am i am drinking a decaf espresso with salted caramel baileys hence the name salted caramel for this episode it is fantastic just a little a little pick me up gives me the illusion that i'm drinking coffee and therefore can be productive (laughs) and it gives me just enough buzz to talk about the second half of sake which oh my goodness i still didn't enjoy but (laughs) before we get into it karen what are you drinking (laughs) i am drinking a peanut butter stout from lead dog brewing if you haven't gotten the gist of what i like it's stouts and um the more interesting you can make them the better i have always wanted to try a peanut butter beer or peanut butter like liquor there's this peanut butter whiskey at this like store that i go to frequently okay. and i i am one i am well i need to be wealthier to want to spend my money on that right but i do want to try it but i don't want to spend so much money on it that then i buy it and then it's really bad because uh, i don't think you can return it half drank no 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 probably i <clears throat> i've not tried but i would imagine no <laughs> 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 Uh, so do you want to you want to give a background about uh like yeah. part two of sankhya maybe it'll help me enjoy it more i don't <laughs> think so but maybe i it might is this bad for me to not enjoy the only the, to enjoy the thing that i have assigned ourselves to read <laughs> maybe <laughs> well I'll, I'll try to bounce you up because i do enjoy the second half okay oh, we're gonna have a really good like point counterpoint dynamic Ooh. going on pretty soon okay perfect <laughs> all right i'm really looking forward to that uh so Last week, we kind of talked about Russia in the 90s and how that kind of feeds into the general malaise that a great deal of the Russian public felt, of course, also among the post-Soviet states and in non-Russian countries, but we're talking from Prelepin's perspective. Prelepin is a really interesting character because, as you might be aware, Prelepin was a longtime member of the political party, the National Bolsheviks, which was and is a banned political party in Russia. I'm not going to go too deep into the philosophy of National Bolshevism because a friend of Matt and mine is really well informed on National Bolsheviks and I'm not nearly that well informed. If he, if he ever listens to this, uh, he's going to come for us. So I don't want to do that. So mm-hmm. I'm only going to talk about it from Prelepin's perspective and how that kind of explains Prelepin in the modern era. TLDR. National Bolshevism is a sort of Bolshevik or left-wing or communist economic program which works in tandem with a really strongly nationalist cultural element, therefore, and thusly, National Bolshevism. That goes a lot of different ways. The essential thing to know about National Bolshevism is that it's kind of a... 
I don't want to say it's a literary party, but its founder was Edward Lee Molnoff, who was kind of first and foremost a poet. So it's not a militant party in the same way you might expect from other hardline political groups. And that has resulted in there being quite a few wings of the National Bolshevik Party, which is another reason I wouldn't really want to explain it, because it takes a long time, because there are a lot of sometimes contradictory wings of it. But from Prilepin's perspective, National Bolshevism is kind of tied to really the blood and soil part of it. And that's what you see reflected in Sankhya. The the program is strongly related to an opposition to bourgeois culture. And in this sort of ideology, the bourgeois culture in the context of Russia is the liberal class which created the shock therapy era and the resulting economic capitalization of the country. So you have a group of advisors and a new political class and economists who believe that liberal economics and is the way forward for Russia. And they implement that through an incredibly harsh, we cannot go back kind of method. The goal was almost more so to destroy what was before than it was to build what is to come to prevent the possibility of going back. And that really threw Russia into a pretty difficult situation for a long, long time. And you see that reflected in Sankhya again. So this opposition to the bourgeois liberalism of Russia is really characteristic of the Prilepin wing of the National Bolshevik Party. And conversely, what they support is the notion of Russia. And that's really tied to the idea of fatherland, the idea of ethnicity. I wouldn't go so far as to say that National Bolshevism is an explicitly racist party, but the underlying blood and soil rhetoric which really comes through in Sankhya is absolutely a feature of it and for this reason you could kind of classify this prelepin part of the national Bolshevik party as essentially conservative although it does integrate a fairly left-wing economic program what it really is focused on is the nationalist element And why that's more important than the economic program relates to the way that it interacts with society. So let's go back to Prilepin for a moment. At the time of Sankhya's publishing, Prilepin was kind of an outsider to the Russian political mainstream. Of course, the national Bolsheviks were and are a banned party. Prilepin was was protesting against the government. The president, who's not mentioned by name in Sankhya, but is very clearly supposed to be Putin, is not portrayed well, and is the objective of the book is to humiliate this president. Very strongly anti-government. However, in the modern era, Prilepin has actually become very supportive of the Putin government. This happened around 2016 when the Russian government began to kind of take on a more nationalistic overtone. Of course, that was sort of underlying, but that really became very strongly forward in the annexation of Crimea and started more aggressive actions in Eastern Europe as a whole. Prilepin actually went and fought with some of his old comrades in Ukraine on the pro-Russian side from about 2017 to 2018. And through this whole period, he's begun writing very favorably about the Russian government, including Putin. And initially, it might seem like a really weird turnaround. How can you go from wanting to humiliate and throw out and maybe even kill the president to being being supportive of this presidency? It makes more sense if you start to look at his politics in terms of a sort of nationalist perspective. The important thing is bringing back the Russian identity and and strengthening that, which is absolutely something that the uh, government under Putin has begun embracing more strongly. So the transition from anti-government to pro-government really makes a lot more sense if you see that as being kind of the nexus, the really important thing here, and the rest of it is something that kind of follows, especially the economic program. So that will play into our reading of Sankhya today. And A lot of people, I think, read Sankhya or read Sankhya as an analysis or a sort of diagnosis of the Russian malaise of the mid-2000s, but I really think it might better be read as a sort of thesis that Prelepin is trying to put forth. But we'll get into that. Let's get into that. So we left off last week at the end of Chapter 7, where Sasha is basically just beaten by the secret police, and it, it... kind of leaves on a cliffhanger which would be more of a cliffhanger if it didn't happen in like dead center of the book even slightly less than dead center actually yeah so i mean i i guess you could have killed off your main character it's not like in my opinion it's not like any of the characters really had uh that many defining characteristics to them anyways but i digress 
uh, it would have been very, very strange to kill off the uh, to kill off Sasha at that point. And that obviously does not happen. Chapter eight uh, starts off with Sasha crawling to the road. He's barely alive and he's able to get uh, taken to the hospital by somebody driving along and he, he gets stitched up. Nothing is nothing is actually as bad or severe as it seems. I guess there's no like serious internal damage. He's survived this beating barely, but he has. And the doctors stitch him up, and he wakes up in a room. He can't really, he can't really do much. He's just sore and bruised everywhere. And he's sharing a room with this man whose name is Lev, who is Jewish, and that sets up this interesting conversation, which is kind of the main part of this chapter, I think, where he, Sasha, is talking with Lev about politics, Russia as a whole, and. Lev's main point goes back to something that we talked about last week, this idea of westernizers, Slavophiles, like the ideology that has driven changes and ideas in Russia since the 19th century and before. And Lev says he wants to he wants to reject that binary. He wants to he really he wants to reject ideology as a whole. He he actually says he was with the ideas of the founders at the beginning and he kind of no longer is. Which is interesting because the founders really pretty explicitly don't like Jewish people. So it's interesting to see kind of their relationship with Russian Jews throughout this throughout this book. And so they kind of they go through and Sasha at this point is just really angry throughout the rest of the arguments in the book. So he doesn't really, you know, he's not changing anybody's mind here. And he Sasha found, finds out from Rogov, one of his friends, one of the founders that comes to the hospital, says that they saw Yana leaving the FSB, the secret police headquarters, after he was uh, after he was picked up. What else happens? Kind of a lot of like loose strands. Uh, the the secret police raided Sasha's mom's place, and she calls the founders' bunker to let him know, and it gets relayed to Sasha, and he gets angry, and that that furthers his his distaste for the government. And he's eventually discharged. He goes to another protest a couple of days after. He sees Yana. He confronts her and he says, you know, did you did you sell me out? And then, like, why would she say that she did? So she doesn't really, really indicate much. I think it's kind of implied that she did, though. And with that, Sasha decides to head home. Uh, how'd you, how'd you, do you like that chapter? How do you feel about that chapter? I was, I was good with that chapter. I actually kind of looked at this as a really big turning point. Because mm -hmm. there are only so many scenes where Sasha actually debates someone. And for me, this yep. is the only scene where Sasha actually debates someone. Because every other time, it is... Well, it's actually almost always with Bezlatov or Bezlatov and someone else. And he basically just listens. So this is the only time in the book that he really talks back to someone. And actually, he quite likes Lev. At the very end, before they kind of part ways, not really in speaking terms... Sasha thinks, well, why'd I have to go and say all that? Because he's a good man, which is interesting. Uh, and I think that this is kind of where you get maybe the thesis of the book uh, at a point when they are kind of at the point where they agree before they start to diverge. And they're like, yeah, we need to reject the past and the present. Lev comments. <laughs> oh, part of the reason why he likes Lev is, is something that Lev says early on. Some executioners took Russia away from other executioners, and no, is, and no one knows which of the executioners is the better. Uh, and later on, Sasha says back to him when they're kind of arguing over what things sh should be, Sasha says, All ideology is long gone. In our time, the new ideology are instincts, actions. The handing down of intellectual ideas is outdated, has disappeared forever. And that's really important for understanding the book, because... Sasha is not putting forth a coherent ideology for understanding life. Sasha is putting forth, for the rest of this book, essentially, an ideology of action. That you don't always have to have it figured out. The important thing is that you get the momentum going. And that's why I think this chapter is really important. Because he is, for the first time, willing and capable to express that to someone. Whereas in older chapters, he was really self-conscious about his lack of book learning and when he's talking to professors he feels kind of beaten down and and he needs to go to rogov 
more articulate founders to say why that person he disagrees with is actually bad. He's got to go to them and ask them, like, what what is it I dislike? Now he's actually able to articulate that to someone. And that's why I think this is really important. And even, you know, of course, it's your point about Lev being Jewish. He even tries to deny that the founders are anti-Semitic, uh, which, of course, is like it falls flat on its face. And I don't, I don't know if Prelepin intended that to be the case or not. But when Lev asks about anti-Semitism in their movement or generally in like kind of uh, movements of change in Russia, Sasha responds that anti-Semites have always been non-Russian, like Gogol or a lot of other famous writers, or the anti-Semites have always been Jewish themselves, at which point Lev kind of thinks, oh, really? Which is a brief moment of self-awareness. But yeah, I, I actually thought it was really interesting and really important for understanding what follows. I think this this book for me, reading it the second time, I've been able to separate a little bit more where Perlepin is coming from and what is what is him, what is the character. But the, the arguments for me are a little bit where I kind of lose track of that. I can't tell if he is being self-aware or if he is not. I would like to believe he is and he's kind of satirizing this idea. I don't I don't know. I think as you were saying, like a turning point, that's to me what this chapter really was. Mm. Well, I actually I agree with you. Or I I will say I think Prilepin is self aware, and that's why he gives Lev the reaction he does to Sasha's answer. However, I do not think that that is necessarily him kind of implicitly condemning Sasha. I think this might be kind of a case of He's aware that sometimes the rhetoric or even the beliefs are ridiculous, but he's maybe trying to argue that that's not so important because what is important is action. At the end of the chapter, one of the very last thing that, things that Sasha says, and I think this might be one of the few cases where Prelepin is really kind of voicing through Sasha his own perspective, although, of course, you always have to have that separation. This is just a mm -hmm. shot in the dark on my part. Uh, but Sasha says... It's not true, Lev, when they say that life is always a choice. When something is true in life, you don't have any choice. If you have love for, say, a woman, you already have no choice. It is either her or nothing. And if you have a motherland, here it is the same. And I think that's one of the few cases where he is really kind of actually kind of addressing not only Lev, but also the reader in that maybe Sasha isn't always right, but he's trying to do what is right. Perhaps. Yeah. It seems to me the conclusion of the argument kind of happened, or the conclusion of the argument and the conclusion of his turn that is completed in this chapter happens not actually with Lev, but at the protest. Mm. And it was like kind of nestled in the middle of a paragraph. And it's not something he even says, it's something he realizes to himself. He says, it says, it occurred to him that he wanted to kill every single one of them, and he meant it. He's talking mm. about police officers here. And I, don't I think like one of the reasons that Sasha was more sympathetic up until this point was the fact that he wasn't really that violent. He was kind of just I you didn't really know exactly what to make him. Like I said, he's really shy, kind of I don't know, nothing nothing that crazy. He had like, you know, radical ideas, but he wasn't really I he himself wasn't the super violent I want to kill everybody, you know. He's maybe I'll help flip a car over or something in a protest, which is a different line, I think, property versus lives and this is where i think the book continues to take it which yeah. is sasha getting just really angry and just wanting to kill people which i think prelepin may be implicit may be implicitly suggesting is the necessary sort of behavior but we'll get into that so chapter nine opens with the founders going back to riga the ones who had seized the watchtower in protest of the old Soviet World War II vets who were being tried and the founders that were involved were sentenced to 15 years in prison, which they thought was really harsh since they didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't kill anybody. They didn't really do much. They just kind of seized this, this watchtower, this clock tower, whatever it was. And, but it caused such a big national scandal that that's when the government is prompted to actually do something is when other people start to notice. And so Sasha is talking with Matt Vey, who is in charge of the founders at this point, and he says it wasn't Yana that actually, you know, got him in trouble. It was this new guy that they had let in. He seemed fine, and he was really good with technology, and he gave them all burner phones to use, and they checked the story, and it seemed that it all worked out, but he says, no, they were actually tapped, which is why Sasha got picked up. 
begging the question, why was Sasha the only one to actually get picked up? So it's, you know, I think obviously not truthful. I didn't read it that way. Although it does point out that Sasha was the first one to use the phone and he was immediately picked up, which clued them off that they should not continue mm. to use the phones. And he kind of says, you saved the rest of us. Interesting. Okay. All right. So there's still some doubt for Yana. Who's to say? Yeah. So they are watching the news and they're, they're, they're talking about the founders in Riga and what they're fighting for. And somebody who was taking part in in the sentencing of these World War II vets is, you know, on the TV. And Sasha says, basically, like, I would kill him again. And he exchanges glances with Matt Faye. And he's like, yeah, no, I really mean it. I would actually kill him. And so Matt Faye's like, oh, in that case, I got a really <laughs> good assignment for you in Riga. Uh, and, but he's like, oh, a small thing. You're going to need a gun. And Sasha's like, all right, fine. So he goes to this guy, Oleg, who is just a character in and of himself. He's like kind of associated with the founders. He's not a founder ideologically. He just likes chaos. He uh, served in Chechnya. He joined Oman, the secret special police force. He was kicked out. Uh, and then he went back to Chechnya. And now he's just kind of lurking about. And this is the guy that Sasha goes to get a gun from. I also want to point out that that pretty closely mirrors uh, Zakhar Prelepin's actual life. Mm -hmm. And any doubt in my mind that this was sort of a self-insert was kind of washed away when Sasha goes to his house with um, Vera, who I don't think we've talked about yet, but she's a girl that he sees at a protest. Mm -hmm. She's into him. She follows him around. They go to Oleg's apartment. He tells them to come in, and he's completely naked when they walk in. And the only thing that Sasha notes is that uh, Oleg covers his considerable package. So, <laughs> which is almost the very first thing we learn about Oleg is that he's got a big dick. So I'm pretty certain this is a self insert mm -hmm. for Zucker Free Lepin because no, mm -hmm. almost no character gets much like description. Most characters yeah. are like, oh, they're kind yeah. of like childlike or they were swelled up because they were drunk. But Oleg is unique mm -hmm. in that he very first thing we learn yeah. big dick yeah that's just like that i think this is where also i feel like the writing doesn't in a lot of places it doesn't culminate in anything which is why the second part to me mm. is just such a letdown because there are so many good instances in which Berlepin could have really developed the first half instead of doing what he did which was talking about all like naked for <laughs> a significant portion of this chapter but and like vera being which, of course, not really Vera, but Vera being puppeted by Prelep and being really into it. Yeah. Despite being maybe underage? Uh, I don't know. I didn't th think she was. It's possible. She's repeatedly described as childlike, which doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I'm just saying it's a weird pattern throughout this whole book. Yeah, it's something that I wish I didn't pick up on, but yeah, it, it definitely is a d descriptor of a lot of the women. I don't know. Um, I didn't... Oh, yeah, I did mention her later in my summary of this chapter, but I didn't include her too much just because uh, she's really not mm. that interesting and neither is anything that happens between yeah. her and any of the other characters. I think Perlepin just does not write good female characters. Like, eh, any of the characters, pick literally any of them, they suck. They're really poorly <laughs> written. I, that's just, that's my strong feeling on it. But at least some of them have an internal life. I, yeah, I don't know. The only one that they kind of come close with is Yana, but then they totally throw it away when they wrote, uh, they, Prelepin throws it away when he writes that sex scene, which completely tarnishes uh, anything yeah. that the book had going by that yeah. point. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So this chapter, not really that much happens. Uh, they, he's able to get the gun. He goes down to this basement and there's just this absolute racking incident where they get the, they get the gun and they just hear this like squealing and and they shine a flashlight on it, and it's just like these these rats who are like tied together at the tail and like melted at the limbs, and they're all atrophied, and they're in this big ball. And so, like, shoots them with the pistol and stomps on the rest of them with his boots and with his shovel. Oleg does. And oh, Oleg, that's what I said, right? You just said he. Ah, Oleg. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> and it's who I was thinking of in my mind because who else would such such a brute? Um, and yeah, so that I think. Yeah, the only other snippet we get is at the end of this chapter, he Sasha meets Bezeltov at a train platform on his way to Moscow, and he's now working in the city government, and he says some joke about how they're now 
class enemies or something, which, <laughs> oh, Veselov, if you only knew how this book ends for you. And I think this was like the, the Rat King thing was like clearly the main focus of yeah. this, I think. I, there's so many ways to draw this as a metaphor to talk about Sasha's progression towards violence. I think that's probably the main primary function that it serves is he's talking about, I want to kill people. I want to kill these people. I dislike these people, so I'm going to kill them. And now he sees these rats and he, you know, watches them, watches them get killed. And it's it's kind of, kind of a catalyst towards what he's not like consciously, I guess, working towards, but what his character mm. works towards in like the larger right. plot, I think. I mean, you could kind of read this as, I guess, the low point. If you want to understand the second half of the book as like an independent character arc from the first half, this is kind of the low point where he mm-hmm. is, is about to go theoretically kill a human being. But when he sees Oleg killing these rats, he's feel he feels really uncomfortable and is kind of like, squeamish or yep. like has to keep telling him to shine the light on the rats so he can <laughs> crush them with his boot or cut their heads off with his trowel yeah i don't know i don't know if i yeah like i get that he's kind of squeamish but for me is this is almost like i don't know if you can draw this direct metaphor but the rats are kind of a metaphor for the way that the economy and kind of the general social sphere in russia has atrophied as well and the only way out as disgusting and terrible as it is is just to kill it break it burn it down and then you have a clean floor for something new. And I think that's what this chapter is also trying to get at before it gets to right. Sasha actually trying to carry that out. Fair. So in chapter 10, Sasha is arriving in Riga by train. He has been given this elaborate plan by Madfi to arrive and get his gun without being detected by security and then go kill the judge that sentenced um, Negative and their other comrades to prison for 15 years. And as he's arriving in Riga, he increasingly thinks about himself, and his self-image reflects a bringer of rage and terror, kind of the figure that Bezlatov was warning him he would become at the beginning of the book. And right when he's arriving in Riga, he begins to smile, and in the book it says, Sasha was ready to punch and kill anyone, and it made his smile incredibly light. It floated weightlessly on his face. Now that stands in contrast to what actually happens when he tries to kill the drudge. So he spends the next two days wandering around Riga, trying things out, being incredibly awkward in a place which is not Russian-speaking, which I feel that. Uh, I mean, (laughs) being in a foreign... (laughs) Being in a (laughs) place where they speak a foreign language, not specifically in any place where they don't speak Russian. On the day that he's going to go kill the judge after walking around getting a feel for the area, he gets pretty drunk on his way there, and he kind of follows the judge after court he's getting ready to kill him he's hyping himself up he's not entirely there because he's pretty drunk but before he can do anything someone else runs up and guns the judge down so he in a state of shock walks up to the body picks up a cartridge looks around realizes that he still has a gun he's standing in front of a dead judge and he's not a lot via national so he bails and he's followed by a reporter for a while but he kind of threatens the guy and then goes and gets back on the train The most important thing in this chapter really is, I think, his arc in trying to kill the judge, which is certainly not for a lack of trying. This chapter for me is more of a transitory chapter. I don't know if you got anything out of it. I hated every second of this chapter. It seemed (laughs) like what should have been the culmination of the book. And I just like, okay, like when we were discussing this in class, when I was reading this for a course, People were really into this idea of like Sasha in a country that wasn't Russia. And how does he relate to it? And how does he deal with it? That, he just <laughs> drinks. That's it. <laughs> he just He's drunk for the whole chapter. He almost kills the judge. Yes, that is probably the worst situation in anyone's life to be in, which is like you you didn't just do something, but it's totally <laughs> going to look like you did. Uh, although that being said, he was going to do it. So I don't know. I don't know if this is Perlepin trying to cast doubt on whether or not Sasha would have actually done it. I I don't know. I didn't t- I didn't have any doubt that he would have actually done it personally at this point. So my only doubt was whether or not he could have shot straight enough to hit the judge. But yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I'm. I. What did you like? What did you think about the fact that it was a man who was very well armed? Because Sasha had like a just a crappy basement pistol. This man came up <laughs> with an SMG and yeah, like. And then they just don't write about him for the rest of the book. Like I didn't really take anything from that. I thought it was just mm. it's kind of it's exciting because the guy just he doesn't just go shoot the judge and walk away. He runs up, 
shoots the judge, throws his gun away, covered in his fingerprints, by the way, and then just runs away, which Mm -hmm. is an exciting moment. I don't know if it's necessarily possesses any deeper meaning. People like when I was saying this, we're trying to make this (laughs) some sort of conspiracy theory. I don't know what conspiracy there really is to be drawn. They were like, oh, it's, you know, the Russian government sent an agent because they also didn't like the judge. And I was like, Uh, maybe. I don't think Prilepin would have written that in. I, there are plenty of things which Prilepin does accuse the Russian government of doing, including murder, but he makes it very explicit when that's the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I was like, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know to what effect writing such a vague and veiled sort of yeah. thing would uh, enhance the work. So, anyways, that was something I had heard, and I was didn't, didn't really like it because I I didn't again. I just, this is my least favorite chapter of the work. I, it was such a slog to read through my first time and my second one. Yeah, I, I, it's part of an arc for me. That's about it. It's a transitionary chapter, more important things. Uh, Speaking of, let's transition Mm -hmm. to a bitter chapter, chapter 11. So Sasha leaves Riga by train exactly as he arrived and he drinks the whole way back to Russia, tries to cheat his way out of a bill is not successful, but he feels pretty good all the same. He goes to see his mother uh, for maybe the second time in the book, who is working as a nurse at a practice, and they (laughs) talk for a little bit. She expresses worry about him. He brushes it off. She gives him about half of the money she has left. He, like a really bad son, takes that money (laughs) and goes. And then he goes and meets with Bezletov, as he agreed to do before he left for Riga. And Bezletov has a friend who is coming soon, and he wants to talk with Sasha, and he thinks may help Sasha. And this is another interesting point in the book. When they're discussing, and Bezletov says something, and Sasha calls him a liberal, Bezletov responds, liberal, is that a dirty word? And then Sasha says, in Russia, it's worse than the plague. (laughs) Which, I gotta give it to (laughs) Sasha for that moment, that was pretty funny. Uh... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was probably the only zinger Sasha's had in an argument <laughs> yeah, ever, probably. I think. But at some point, Bezletov calls Sasha a fascist, and Sasha goes off and is like, fascist, how you love this word. You have an erotic relationship with it, which may be important for us to talk about later, but it's just a light note I want to put a little flag in. So Bezletov's friend comes, and he's essentially kind of an old guard believer. And he, for the most part, agrees with Sasha and is kind of making fun of Bezletov. But where they differ is their ultimate conclusion, where Sasha believes in sort of we need to have an upheaval now to create a conscious Russian population. And Bezletov is like, we need to let the Russian spirit carry on while the nation dies out. This guy is like, we can keep what you want. We can keep this notion of Russianness, but it will take kind of an institutional turn. We need to have the levers of power do it for us. We need to kind of take this on. Which is kind of like, I I guess you could maybe, if you wanted to ascribe it to any real world party, some sort of like KPRF or uh, Communist Party of the Russian Federation or or Liberal Democratic Party sort of thing, which might be interesting. But Sasha tells him to go fuck himself and then leaves. Uh, So when he is on his way home, Sasha decides to basically rob a guy after he sees him flaunting a lot of money in a store. And this is the money that will sustain (laughs) Sasha for the rest of the book. So he he immediately divides up the money in the thirds, decides to give a third to his mom, a third to positive to pay for negative stuff in prison and also to help him get by. Also to pay him back for the money that he he took from him earlier in the book. And also, I just got to say, thank God he's giving some of his money back to his mother because I think it said that she gave him a 500 ruble note, which is like $7 maybe, uh, maybe more in 2007 or less. I don't know, but not much more or less. So this woman's got a grand total of 15 bucks in her purse. That is just, ah, tough. Yeah, yeah. So then Sasha, ever the responsible decision maker, goes on a bender, buys a bunch of sausages, eggs, pickles, three bottles of vodka. Everything you need for a good bender. Yeah, I I wouldn't deny that. That is, that's true. He prepares well. And he's drunk for about three days straight until his mother comes home and finds the vodka bottles. She says to him, are you drinking? And he's like, I'm done now. And then internally, his monologue is like, somehow he knew he was done. (laughs) And when he's kind of, he's still struggling with that a little bit, his mom leaves. And then he watches like an old 
movie on TV, Chapayev, which I, it's not super clear. I couldn't tell if it's supposed to be like sort of a, a movie about really old, like 13th century Russia or a ripoff Western kind of movie. But basically that inspires him to be a better person by like national Bolshevik standards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so after watching this movie, which inspires him to be a better person, he calls up all of his friends who are still in his unnamed provincial town and Oleg and Vera and they go and torch a McDonald's. And while the police are distracted with that, they go and actually, for real, torch the local branch of the president's party. I forget what name they call it, but essentially it's United Russia. And they are feeling really good. Until the next day when they wake up in Oleg's aunt's apartment, where they are hiding from the cops, and turn on the news. They see footage of Yana being dragged across the floor... She's mentioned as being very bloody, and the news reporter is kind of talking about how this person who egged the president, you know, was beaten, and her teeth are being strewn across the floor, and no one knows where she is now, and then they go to footage of the president, vaguely described, who's now covered in eggs and rotten pasta and all kinds of other unidentified disgusting substances, and is just absolutely humiliated on TV. Which is a bit of a turning point, because suddenly things go very wrong. So they quickly go into hiding, they realize that this is really serious, and when Sasha is now just kind of waiting around outside, not sure what to do, Matvi shows up again. Matvi basically tells Sasha, no one knew about Yana's plan, and now the feds are coming down on them like Mjolnir. And basically they've been raided and he is not sure what to do next. He knows that they have training camps which are still hidden from the cops, but they don't know what to do about that. And also, this is just a side point, but Sasha clearly does not care about Vera, even though at this point they've started sleeping together and he refers to her as his girlfriend. Uh, she's like, Throughout this book, trying to find affection from him, there's multiple points where he mentions that she was clearly trying to take his hand and then he kind of bats it away. But he's also really possessive of her and he keeps thinking about her as my Verochka, especially when, everyone, when anyone else looks at her. Just a weird thing to note. There's a lot of weird things to note with that relationship. <laughs> I don't yeah. like it. I don't know if that's supposed to be the point of it. That's part of the problem is I don't know what's supposed to be the point of it. I just... Yeah. I'd look at it and I don't like it. So that's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I also, I don't know how this plays into the Yana storyline. Like, maybe somebody's going to listen to this and be like, yeah, you idiot. Like, of course, this was something, something, something. But the whole thing was that the founders were trying to lay low after right. the, I think after the Riga incident, they, I, I know they said that Matvey had friends, like higher ups that he was talking to, and they kind of threatened him or advised him strongly to not do anything like this, not do anything that would require them to take serious action, basically. And as everybody apparently in the country at this point, or, you know, from reading the book is able to determine things that cause a national or international scandal are highest priority for the government to deal with, even if they don't actually cause anyone to be really physically harmed, even if it's just throwing a bag of food on somebody, well, the president, but, yeah, you know, something like that. That's like, you may as well have murdered him. That's how seriously they're taking it. Yeah. And so I don't know, like, because Yana was supposed to be a founder, a, 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 not a, she is a founder. She's supposed to be like a leader of the founders, right? So she would have known that their plan was to stay low, right? Uh, but then she went ahead and did this anyways. I don't know. Maybe it reflects the fact that she was ostracized when they thought she was, but we can get into that later uh, mm -hmm. because there's still a lot left in this just absolute just like drop kick of a chapter. <laughs> yeah, this was a this was a thick and juicy one. <laughs> yeah, so they're all basically like, "Oh God, what do we do?" And they decide to go to Sasha's village to hide out for a little while. On their way there, in Oleg's car, they break down. There's a house there. They decide to stay. And the owner's really hospitable. He puts them down, gives them some tea, goes to find his wife. And while they're there, an old man hangs out with them. They chat. Actually, the old man kind of harangues at them, which I think is pretty important. They mostly ignore him until the man of the house comes back with the woman of the house, or the lady of the house, as she's referred to in the book. And they hang out there. They sleep there. And the next morning, they turn on the news and watch it and find out that a number of their friends have actually been killed. Lyosha Rogov, who we met earlier in the book, was mysteriously murdered. The news reports that three men 
the three men were reported leaving his building, getting getting into a car which matches plates owned by the Federal Security Bureau, otherwise known as the FSB. Well, it says that he committed suicide, but yes. I feel like you can feel the air quotes on that through the, <laughs> through the page. Yeah. <laughs> the TV is like, he committed suicide, but also three men were noted leaving the apartment in a building car belonging to the FSB, which seems... This is just absolutely stupid in terms of how, like, in terms of operational security. But uh, given how the the apartment bombings that went down shortly before the Second Chechen War went down, which the FSB may or may not have been involved in, maybe it's not actually that far beyond what their actual operational capability in this era. I think it's it's I I thought this was a perfectly plausible scene. I just I think that it's supposed to show the complete. Not only disorganization, but just they don't care. They can they can just kind of do whatever they want as long as there is just a little bit of shred of yeah. deniability. You know, maybe that's where they get donuts on that day. Who's to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a few other of their friends who I don't think we've mentioned are killed. Uh, and they get really angry. And they decide that this is, this is the day of reckoning. Matt Fee thinks... We have enough force to basically take the country, or at least take capitals of the country. And he thinks that the leader, Kostenka, this is what Kostenko would want. So they decide to go back. And the only last thing to note here is that uh, Vera basically gets cold feet and tells them their Russia is dead. And I think this is important for Sasha's character. While she's like freaking out about them deciding to go back and start a revolution, he tells her to shut up or he's going to crack her skull. And then when she goes quiet, he internally thinks uh, that he'd like to actually kill her. Oh, sorry. No, he tells her he's going to throw her out of the car, but then he thinks he wants to crack her skull. So maybe this is reflective of Sasha finally getting the will to kill when he's decided that he's ready to kill this friend, his his quote unquote girlfriend who is on his side, who is now getting cold feet about doing violence. This is why I feel like maybe I'm missing point of like part of the book where I'm just mm. like, can you end it, please? I'm bored of what's happening. <laughs> I'm bored of Sasha's character. Yeah. I understand he's being radicalized and it's important to understand the sources of where he's drawing his anger from and how the state and the government and society has done a bad job at kind of integrating not only him, but the whole new generation in a meaningful and impactful way is really important. But... I am bored of Sasha by this point <laughs> in the book. At this point, he no longer has any nuance in his character, I don't think, in the same way that he does in the beginning of the book. Mm, yeah. And maybe you feel differently, but I just like, I was like, oh my goodness, I still have so much of this book left to read. No, I agree. I think he's slowly having his nuance whittle out of him. I think that that's the point, which I'm, I think you might mm-hmm. agree with. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, it is much less engaging intellectually from this point forward which i think is also the point yeah maybe it is maybe that's kind of why i'm just banging my head over over kind of this book and this i don't know it yeah. um it's still again on my second time reading it it's a it's a more impactful and a and a better more enjoyable read overall i i understand the point of the second half and how it functions in the narrative more than i did the first time but that being said, I still don't like it that much. Right. That makes sense. I don't know. Then let's wrap it up. Chapter Do 13. It. Wrap it. So <clears throat> on their way back to this unnamed provincial town, Sasha falls asleep and dreams about his father's village, where he dreams his grandparents are waiting for him. And as is his father, he drives up in a car, but suddenly, as dreams are wont to go, is in a truck and begins to unload bodies which is about the point that he wakes up. And uh, they go into quick scene transitions here. Vera departs forever, both from their lives and the story. They decide on what to do next. The group collectively decide to abandon Positive uh, because Negative didn't want his brother to be involved in this. So the next day, they leave before Positive gets back from watering his brother's plants. And then they go and raid an Oman base, which is, as you mentioned in the last episode, sort of a riot police outfit. And, of course, Oleg is a former Oman member. He's able to kind of bargain his way into their base, and then while they're distracted in the middle of the night, the rest of the founder group in this town rush them and take all their weapons, uniforms, and vehicles. And they leave all the all the Oman members who were there tied up in a cage outside. 
Uh, as they drive away, Oleg puts a flag on the car and remarks that everything you do only once in your life, you should do a style. And then they just go and cause mayhem in this town. They raid the police station and set fire to it. When the fire department shows up, they shoot at the tires. Uh, you know, they're, they're acting very cheeky at this point. They go and rob a store, take a bunch of alcohol and cheese and other foods. The police try to chase them. They throw flash grenades at them and scare them off. And then finally seize City Hall. While they're in the process of doing that, of course, it's very early in the morning, so most people aren't there yet. Sasha actually encounters Bezlatov working in the governor's office, and they have a short interaction before Sasha chains him to a radiator near a window. And at that point, they kind of wait. They turn on the news to see what is happening. And they've discovered that the founders, although they failed in their mission to take the capital in Moscow, have actually taken control of 30 capitals across Russia, which I think Russia has about 60 to 70 oblasts or, or regions. So that's about half of Russia they have they've seized the, seized the capitals of. And they wonder what happens next. The military shows up, they take position. Positive shows up again. He tries to get into City Hall and he's shot in the leg. At this point, Sasha completes his arc in the book, and he turns to Bezletov, who has been his intellectual rival and the dominator of his intelligence this whole book. He uncuffs him with a gunshot, and then he defenestrates him, throws him right at the window. Wow, we finally got a way in to use the word defenestrate appropriately. I am always waiting for that. I, let's end the podcast now. <laughs> I am so <laughs> proud. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> he did it, boys. All right, five episodes. We'll, uh, <laughs> see you next podcast. Uh, Next time, Latvian literature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not laughing at Latvian literature, just at... <laughs> the amount of projects we come up with. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, so at that point, they get ready for whatever's coming, and Sasha feels that this moment both is about to end and will never end. And that's where the book ends. I like the ending, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Uh, I like the wording of the ending. There's two lines <laughs> that I underlined that I liked. Uh, one is a couple paragraphs back, whereas <laughs> Sasha sitting out the windowsill with his machine gun, he says, or he thinks, everything under the frost, it will thaw and muds will flow. And that's kind of what he was thinking. And then that's not how the book ends, though. It ends with the line, any minute, any second, everything would end and nothing would end. It would continue going on just like this. And so it like it almost wants to end hopeful, but it it, it doesn't really. I think it ends in i don't know complicit acceptance of this is the way of things perhaps i think the important ending of the book is really in the moment where he kills bezlatov i mean for me that is the completion of his arc where he mm -hmm. goes from bezlatov intellectually dominating him for the whole book and it's i think it's important to note that he never wins an argument with bezlatov bezlatov is always the victor of those conversations eventually sasha just refuses to participate and then finally sasha kills him mm -hmm. which i think might be an underlying thesis of the book going back to what sasha says to lev that the only ideology left is action he doesn't need to respond to bezlatov's taunts or when bezlatov calls him a communo fascist and he jokingly says oh yes we're communo fascists and then later rejects that same terminology saying that bezlatov has an erotic relationship with the word fascist and mm -hmm. he doesn't know what it means you know what sasha is probably is fascist when he jokes that oh yes we're communo fascists he's actually correct even though he's using it in a joking way to make fun mm -hmm. of actually i think it might be lev who calls them that but by the very end of the book he finally embraces what his ideology is which is action which mm -hmm. kind of denies what the actual state of his ideology is which his ideology exists and it certainly is borderline or actually fascist but his personal development relates to this action. And finally, he kills the bourgeois liberal who has been intellectually just putting him out to pasture this whole time. Yeah, I guess maybe that's like maybe uh, part of the reason I don't I don't love certain aspects of the book is not the book. Just the, I guess like the messaging, maybe. Right. Uh, or like because my ideology doesn't line up with Sasha's. Yeah. Maybe that's, I guess, what I'm feeling. I don't know. It's not a whole lot of people do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's still in interesting read and an interesting ending i thought it was interesting how many buildings and capitals that the founders had seized because one of the things that is mentioned a lot is kind of the relationship to the russian revolution which was honestly able to seize control of russia 
um pretty easily i think in terms of like number of buildings seized i think that was one of the things that lenin understood very well which is like you need to seize what like a post office and a newspaper stand not stand a newspaper like printing press and a couple key buildings (laughs) and we have to seize every single one of those little shops that sell cigarettes and like books in the street he does he <laughs> has to seize everyone and he that's why he walks in with his newsy cap is that way he can, <laughs> see, he can seize them all individually um but like i think that like it's really significant that they're able to seize the capital buildings in certain cities all across russia with strikingly little resistance and they're able to seize like those very key what would be considered key outposts uh, with with no resistance, with no problem, and and, and to me, it, it goes back to kind of what Lev was saying: the idea of like you need to abandon old ideologies. Uh, you can't continue to think about things in the same way because now, okay, instead of in Imperial Russia, when you could probably just kind of seize those things, and yeah, they had an army, but not in the same way today when you have like an army army that can go and roll up with tanks and you have like a very militarized uh, riot police that just kind of functions as like a general can beat up anybody they please. And and so it just kind of, it, it ties together, I think, kind of that break between old and new, tying together like new methods of governance with the kind of thoughts that will be needed to break from those current methods, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good way of kind of bringing it all together. If that makes sense. I was fighting that thought along as I was saying it. It, it makes a lot of sense to me because I, all I really have to say about this book is that I think the important thing is the ending and it's just basically kill the bourgeois elite is I think the message of the mm-hmm. book and everything up to that point is just a detailing of how you get there. Not like a manual, but like just a, this is kind of the homo novus, the ideal man of this revolution. It's It's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I think it's actually even somewhat misplaced uh, at Bezeltov. Not that I'm like rushing in to defend him, but mm. he was a university professor who then became a civil servant. It's not like he was making that much money or had really any influence. He was a civil servant assistant in this provincial town that's not even named. So it's interesting that Sasha's anger is so fixated on him. Like I understand the interpersonal dynamics that would lead mm. to that, but it's not like he's actually taking out his anger on the new class of actually rich <laughs> actually mm. rich people like the oligarchs that emerged after right. the fall of the soviet union like that's where i would think that his right. anger would be is like okay there's like five people that control all of our wealth maybe <laughs> i would throw one of them out a window but no instead he's gonna throw out the university professor who is now a civil servant who like probably also doesn't have that much money granted he's kind of a jerk to him throughout the novel <laughs> but like you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. You can't defenestrate every professor that's been a dick to you. No, that would leave no professors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe that is one of the most important things to consider when we're talking about, like, kind of the prolepin part of the National Bolshevik Party, if we kind of cross over into real life here for a moment, mm-hmm. where if you're asking the question, what separates them from other, you know, communist or Bolshevik movements... Well, it's specifically this relationship to liberalism in Russia, which is why national Bolshevism really has no meaning outside of Russia, uh, Mm -hmm. that traditional uh, Bolshevik movements might have huge problems with the moneyed elite. And that would be regardless of whether they were liberal or conservative, regardless of the politics of, of someone in that state, they would be mad at the people that you're talking about. But in this particular variant, the people they're mad at are the, the bourgeois of the economic revolution revolution is maybe a bad word for it because it didn't turn out so well Mm -hmm. but this upheaval in economic policy in in the russian sphere that is specifically who their animosity is directed towards as sort of the deconstructor of a strong you know russian identity this like compartmentalization of life down to the individual level of the person as wage earner rather than a piece of something greater well that's true that's a good point (laughs) but Again, for anything we say, we could someone who is closer to Prelepin or in any sort of politics around this could say, well, this wasn't actually serious. This was serious. That wasn't serious. It's kind of hard to parse. So take of it what you will. It's incredibly difficult, I think, to separate exactly what was serious or like what Prelepin intended to be taken as 
satire of something and what he actually is advocating for in this book specifically, in my opinion. No, I, I agree. That's something that you can see even outside of this specific subsect. It is really hard for a lot of modern movements, I think, because the the irony of so many things is so wrapped up into the humor of many groups that it's hard to separate what people actually believe from what the jokes they tell are. I mean, I mean, when we were in Russia, you and I together, we had like a five person group. We all hung out with all the time. I don't think any of us could have accurately defined each other's politics for like the first two months, three months, because we're so wrapped up in this layer of jokes and irony that no one knows what anyone really believes and what people are just joking around with. I don't even know if I could define everybody's politics at the moment, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think I could either. <laughs> I, I don't know. I feel like that's all I, I have to say about Sankey. I feel like that's all I want to discuss on the second part. Yeah, I agree. So that was Sankhya. All that of it. was Yep, yeah, that was the two parts, which could really be separate books and mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. definitely have varying levels of value and or quality. And with that, Matt, what are we reading for next week? Next week, we're going to be taking a look at Varlam Shalamov's Kalima Tales. We're going to take a look at three of the short stories from there. The three we're going to be looking at are Tamara the Bitch, Faska Denisov, Kidnapper of Pigs, and Major Pugachev's Last Battle. Very exciting titles. Well, I'm excited to read those, and if you all want to read along, you are certainly welcome to. But until then, I think we'll see you next week. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you enjoy this episode, well, first of all, that makes us happy, but also grad school doesn't pay very well, so if you happen to have a few dollars to spare, you can find us on Patreon on patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. It'll help us buy the books we'll be reading in the future. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or visit our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon. Bye.